All right. Uh, hello and welcome and thank you so much for joining us on this special session. Uh, today we're talking on this session for the next 45 minutes or so on global coordination to conquer the effects of COVID. Uh, there is a sense today that COVID has left each one of us and each of our countries really pretty much on our own, to our own devices, because everyone, including the global leaders who perhaps should have known better or could have uh, been able to manage this pandemic better, have not, in fact, uh, been able to do so. The question really is, have our global institutions also failed to fulfill that mandate? Um, because in a sense, COVID has forced the entire world, and uh, it was a world, uh, if I may say so, on steroids, to take this pause, to take a giant pause, and to spend this time really thinking about what kind of world we've built, um, uh, is uh, in fact the kind of gaps we have between people going to become much larger. More and more we're talking not about, uh, you know, a U-shaped recovery or a V-shaped recovery, but a K-shaped recovery around the world where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And ha have some of the things we've done on the digital divide, the access to food security, clean water, access to medicines and healthcare, which is going to become a big issue in the next few months again um, with the vaccine. Uh, have those really been areas of disappointment for the world? Or is there a way really to rebuild the idea of global coordination when it comes to the post-COVID uh, world? Uh, and, uh, and our speakers today are going to talk about a lot of this, um, you know, whether uh, in the medicine sphere, the global agencies have uh, really been able to fulfill that mandate when it comes to the detection of COVID and their treatment, the development of vaccines uh, is going to be, I think, a huge test. The development and distribution of vaccines is going to be a huge test. We may have failed the last test in 2020, but in 2021, uh, most of us will be judged by by how we are able to ensure uh, that treatment and, and vaccines go out to everyone. Uh, whether world institutions, economic global institutions, the World Bank, IMF and others have been able to work on plans for debt waivers, for loans, for sustainability in the future. Uh, and whether even our uh, larger, uh, our security council, our uh, global agencies, when it comes uh, to looking at where the world is, have they help to stop the conflicts around the world, help those fleeing from violence, uh, stopped aggressive behavior by some of the global leaders themselves at this particular time when that was needed the most. Um, we're joined by the experts, so I don't really need to say much more. Uh, we have six great speakers with us. We're hoping uh, that Mr. Marc Antoine Lucini uh, will be able to join us very soon. He's the head of International General Medicines uh, from Sanofi. Um, but I'd like to start perhaps with that global economic picture uh, and see what the sustainable actions for the future are uh, and come to you, Vincent Abad, if I may. Uh, Vincent Abad is the chief executive officer of uh, Romantic Capital in Spain. Spain was, of course, one of those countries that saw this sudden and dramatic rise in cases. Um, and, uh, and, and, and today, many lessons uh, learned are probably coming from Spain as well. Uh, give us a sense of where you see global coordination to deal with COVID is going to be Vincent. Thank, thank you, Suhasini. Uh, well, first of all, I think this crisis has hit everybody with the, you know, completely off guard. Uh, it's a difficult job for wh whoever is in office right now to handle this, no matter whether they are prepared, not prepared, populist, not populist. So whoever is handling this have a tough job, job ahead. The I think currently the global coordination uh, is really behind where it should be. Global leaders, I don't, as everybody's saying, is each country has been doing whatever they can for their own for their own good without really coordinating across the board with with other countries, right? The every measure that's been taken has been very very country uh, specific, and I believe this is a crisis that we will all um, take over together. The in global coordination, for example, I don't think global leaders talk as often as required, not even their health ministers, you know, on uh, neighboring countries, et cetera, et cetera. The, 
one important topic that we need to to point out is that short-term view has been driving the you know the tackling this pandemic and i think we need to point out that this is a long-term crisis healthcare crisis first that's going to be followed by a huge economic crisis that's going to leave 2008 as a appetizer and that we need to assess this is long term first let's tackle the healthcare crisis together and then let's figure out how we rebuild our economies hopefully with a green angle you know taking advantage of the positive that could come out of this you know making a, a more sustainable economy um, come out of this crisis but i don't think first that that global coordination had happened that it, most countries have assessed that this is long term health crisis that's going to be with us for a while that that hasn't settled yet so on the global investors um outlook i will assume people are going to be patient we need to see where the dust settles and and which direction to take we're in no means uh, by no means sorry uh near a reconstruction scenario yet we're still at war with this pandemic and uh, we have to focus first on taking care of the virus and how it affects our societies before we think of how we invest funds towards the recovery of uh, the economies of the world and if there was one because you've charted out that course of how people have uh, uh, not yet you're not seeing a kind of global coordination come together uh if you were to think of that one word that would describe what you think is needed in order for global coordination to be effective uh on covid what would that be trust trust on institutions and trust across a uh, country like uh, cross border trust as well but right. trust is the key word for me interesting uh thanks so much uh we'll move uh, now to our next speaker uh hedvige uh, nuens is the managing director of the international banking federation uh, uh in in the uk um and of course uh, when it comes to trust uh and institutions it is the banking institution that uh that has faced uh, a lot of questions and uh, probably is going to as we move into the recovery phase in the next a uh, year or so hopefully um it is uh, it is your industry in a sense that is going to see the the greatest challenges uh, perhaps when it comes to people's uh, confidence uh how do you see the global uh, pandemic as well as the coordination to fight it going forward yes thank you so much uh, swastini and and indeed as you are saying the banking industry is playing a major role in this crisis um perhaps uh, to the contrary of the previous speaker i can say that the bank industry in itself is is very much aware of risks and has already a long standing uh, record in terms of operational resiliency and how to deal with um, unexpected events so luckily i think we can say that the banking industry uh, this time is playing a very positive role trying to be part of the solution um compared to what happened uh, in the financial crisis where we were very much at the other at the other end uh the two major lessons learned for me so far from covid-19 is at first um we have been working and we are still working together very closely together with public authorities to uh, boost and recover the economy and so large uh, sums are putting uh, put forward both by public authorities and by banks to relaunch the economy to protect livelihoods Uh, and so if we want to do that in a proper way we should really uh, rally again uh, uh, around that team of building back better i think that's so important and it's a, it, it's something that is cross cutting all the um speeches uh, of uh, today's conference uh, so that is how can we contribute when we invest uh, to a better society less inequality a greener society so the way we are going to reboost and reset the economy is very important and the second lessons learned for me so i think is that we have seen that there is major resiliency in the system 
also with uh, the public, with clients. And so what we see, the, 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 the overnight shift to digital, digital economy, has proven that there is great willingness and possibility and opportunity to move uh, quicker to a digital economy, which will actually uh, decrease operational costs and could also contribute to a better society with um, a greater contribution throughout society. Thank you. Um, interesting. And very quickly, if I could ask you, you said, um, you know, that there is this great opportunity for the digital economy to grow. But in a sense, are you not then only addressing yourself to those who are digitally connected? Well, you could say that. But on the other, uh, on the other hand, if you compare, for example, the schooling system, you could say if you move to digital, of course, there will be students, pupils left over. But that's basically the real issue. Rather than denying it, it should be the opportunity, the real trigger to enable everyone in the class, everyone in society to get access. And you can do it in different forms. It doesn't mean that everyone has to have a smartphone, but together with cities, together with public authorities, you really have to contribute and to see how you can enable everyone, every citizen, to get those digital skills and to get access to, to digital platforms. Well, you know, the, uh, uh, and, uh, and the single word you would like to use perhaps uh, to describe how you see global coordination can be most effective? Yeah, I think that COVID-19 has proven that the major uh, issues and challenges of this society are global, uh, be, it, be it pandemic, be it climate, be it inequality, you can just not solve this on your own. And I think that's very big lessons learned. All right. All right. Well, um, it also it, it does sound very idealistic, but that question of access uh, that we were just discussing, um, uh, we have a practitioner on the ground who works on this. Uh, Jayesh Ranjan is our next speaker. He's the principal uh, secretary to the government of Telangana, which is a province or a state in India. Uh, also important because its capital, Hyderabad, is the hub really for life sciences and biotech here. Uh, and he wanted me to point out that four of the six Indian candidates for the COVID vaccine actually have their R&D and manufacturing facilities in his state uh, in India. India has, of course, have had a mixed record. We started really slowly and everybody around the world had this idea that uh, India had, in fact, been able to somehow uh, control uh, the pandemic. But today, in terms of numbers, sheer numbers of cases, India is the second in the world. Um, in terms of deaths, I think uh, uh, the third in the world. But uh, in terms of the per one million population, perhaps India has done better than so many other countries. I'll hand it over to you, Jayesh, to talk about some of the challenges, uh, as well as uh, that specific thing of how we are going to deal in 2021 once that vaccine arrives um, with the distribution and ensure that everyone does have access. Thank you, Swasti. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, I live and work in the Indian city of Hyderabad, which in many ways is uh, the global vaccines capital. In fact, you will be amazed to know that 35% of world's vaccines are manufactured in Hyderabad. So I uh, <clears throat> feel very uh, proud to share this fact with you. And also would like to share a very important perspective about uh, not just vaccine development, but also the distribution and the immunization strategy. And what really prompts me to raise this uh, issue, to bring this table on the, uh, bring this issue on the table is our experience during the H1N1 uh, pandemic days. And many of you will recall that uh, in those days, a few countries, a few rich countries, they bought most of the supply and stocks of the vaccine and they only started donating it to lower income countries when they realized that the infection is perhaps not as serious as uh, it was appearing to be. And of course, they had extra stocks. So this kind of uh, vaccine uh, nationalism or in the context of COVID, COVID protectionism, this will be absolutely detrimental to eliminate COVID. If, uh, in fact, we are already no noticing it. In fact, when in the early days of COVID, when it was uh, suggested that uh, hydroxychloroquine is a panacea, that is the best uh, solution. We saw how uh, we can call it some kind of a gold rush, how people started uh, immediately rushing for placing huge orders of that particular medicine and holding it and stocking it. 
So while lots of COVID activities have been so far done in a very co coordinated and a very harmonious manner, but we may fail all of us, the entire humanity, if we are not able to collaborate well for ensuring an equitable access to the vaccine. So it is the issue is not just about faster development. Of course, the race is on and we are all very optimistic. I am in touch with the four Hyderabad companies who are in that race and they are also very optimistic. But how do you ensure there is a fair and equitable access to the population? We know that there are certain sections of the population which are more vulnerable, the frontline workers, the health workers who are at the highest risk. Who will establish these protocols? Suppose X quantities of vaccines are manufactured, let us say in 20 different countries of the world. Who decides this protocol? Do we again fall into this protectionism, nationalism? And I can also foresee one thing. There would obviously be lots of domestic pressures on this protectionism, nationalism, etc. But this is going to have a very adverse consequence on uh, trade-related issues. In fact, if you start hoarding vaccines as a country, that will increase the trust deficit on you. One of the earlier panelists spoke about trust. My fear is that the trust will actually get eroded. And if the trust is eroded, you will have a multiplier effect on the rest of the trade deals, etc., that you engage in. So this is something which requires a very co 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 coordinated uh, protocol fixing and uh, an institutional arrangement to implement that protocol. Right. Very interesting. One of the other points you have been making is the idea that your state also uh, is responsible for uh, a lot of the uh, the workers that, that travel abroad, migrants as well. Uh, World Bank surveys have shown that each of our countries that are actually providers of migrant labor uh, and uh, receivers of remittances are going to see as much as a 25% dip in those earnings and, um, you know, the return of migrant uh, labors from economies that can no longer sustain that is going to become one of the future issues. Do you want to speak just about that and how uh, you want to see the global community really look at how this can be another crisis? Absolutely. So, uh, in fact, uh, Suhasni, since you work for the Hindu, I don't know whether this is visible or not, but I pulled out a news item which your paper reported uh, 10 days ago. It came on the 20th September. So since it is not visible, I'll just read out. The headline is Indian workers begging in Saudi Arabia. And the first few sentences of this news item is in a sad turn of events, 450 Indian workers working in Saudi Arabia were reportedly put in a detention center after they were found begging on the streets following the expiry of their work permits. Most of these workers belong to Telangana, that is my province, and there are seven other provinces named in this report. In certain videos that have gone, gone viral following the development, workers are heard saying that they did not commit any crime and they have resorted to begging in the face of the hardships they were facing. And the news item goes on. Basically, what it tells is that their work visas expired. The employer had no interest in renewing the visa because obviously the economic impact of the pandemic is being felt by those sectors also. And these workers were left to fend for themselves. But the point which... Uh, such news items, and this is just a news item which I have randomly picked. Mm -hmm. There are many other evidences from other countries as well. Uh, so, though I mentioned Saudi Arabia, there's nothing against Saudi Arabia. This is something which has happened in uh, seven, eight other countries as well. The responsibility which we need to feel, because eventually when you invite migrant workers to contribute to your country's development, you have to see them as people who are partnering in your growth story. If they don't contribute their labor or skills or talent, then the economic successes that you that you achieve tomorrow, you will fall short of all that. So at this time in crisis, what is the responsibility that you have? And again, this is in some ways related to the earlier question, who is setting the global protocols? Every country has guest workers. So just as Indians go to Saudi Arabia and GCC countries, we also receive, for instance, workers from neighboring countries, South Asian countries, and so on and so forth. So there is, as we know, a very dynamic scenario across the globe of workers moving from one place to another in search of jobs, employment opportunities and the skills which they have uh, in certain sectors. So who ensures that at particularly at, at these uh, testing times, we have a social security or a social protection net, that these kind of situations which are reported in the news, they don't uh, happen. All right. 
Um, very interesting because I think this is a part of the the global debate that really hasn't seen a lot of uh, 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 you know a lot of attention put on it yet. Um, our next speaker, I can't see Mr. Siragaldeen, but if he's there, um, maybe you could just turn on the video. Um, otherwise, I'm going to turn uh, to you, Christoph. Christoph Stuckelberger is the founder and president of globalethics.net foundation. You can look it up. It, 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 it does work on so many of these issues, particularly uh, with regard to the ethics of this kind of uh, global crisis. Uh, he was one of the founders of Transparency International in Switzerland uh, as well. And um, to start with, um, uh, Christoph, if I could ask you, you know, you, you may have heard the Indian Prime Minister at the UN General Assembly. He was talking about the need for reform of the United Nations and saying, in a situation like this, where is the UN? Where are the UN agencies? Why have they not been able to come to the rescue of the world when it needed it? So we, um, so there is this kind of uh, frustration with the global agencies, um, and globalization, in a sense, is being rethought. Uh, by so many countries as a result of the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, the world would like to not uh, be pushed back into a more parochial, more hyper-nationalist. And uh, as um, uh, Mr. Ranjan was saying, you know, the kind of vaccine nationalism or protection, COVID protectionism. Uh, where do you see that uh, debate going? Where do you see the challenges when it comes to how global institutions have to reassert themselves? Because, uh, of course, uh, um, without, you know, naming particular countries, but it is global leaders who seem to have shown the least amount of uh, faith, if you like, or uh, support for these global institutions. You need to mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm based, uh, sorry, <laughs> in the midst of uh, the UN agencies in uh, Geneva, I see from my office, uh, WHO, only a few hundred meters away, I see ILO, uh, UNCTAD, WIPO, all this uh, is in Geneva. And uh, your question, of course, is is uh, key. Why is the uh, uh, UN system not uh, stronger? Because the member countries do not allow it. I mean, uh, the, the UN system is a system based on the members. And if the, especially the big member countries are um, blocking and say, we want to be in the lead and not a multilateral institution, I think that is one of the big challenges. And that is leading to what other speakers uh, have been saying, that uh, it needs the will to, to, uh, to cooperate. And that is uh, somehow intention to the will uh, of national solutions, uh, my country first, my population first, my voters first, and uh, th that uh, is contradicting. And that leads me to my uh, contribution, which is linked to, to what are the solutions or what are the contributions. We work on ethics as globeethics.net and the Global Network on Ethics based in Geneva, by, but in, in, all, in 200 countries we have people. And uh, the so what we what the other speakers already said, we can we try to look at what are the value differences behind these questions. So, for example, one of the big debates and and what we see also between continents is how much freedom has to be limited through uh, lockdown and others, or where do we not limit it because freedom overall um, versus uh, for example, in Asia, uh, a strong emphasis on discipline. If we, not only China, if you look at South Korea, other countries who are used to a discipline, so their value of discipline is higher than the value of freedom, of personal individual freedom. So we should look at, at these values and virtues, which are in fact competing to each other. And my, um, I, I, I use the, the lockdown of four months in Switzerland uh, between March and June uh, to finish my book on global balance, as I call it, for a post-COVID world. That means how can we find a world where we can balance these different values? Because freedom all overall cannot be the answer. But of course, we all would agree uh, no freedom can also not be the answer. 
people will go to the street and claim their freedom if they are just locked down. So how to combine this responsibility for the community while still keeping a certain uh, balance for um, for freedom? That is that is one example. Another one is is uh, empowerment. We we want to empower. I mean, education in higher education with universities. We want to empower people to take their lives in their hand. But now, how to empower the individuals while still being in solidarity with the community? That's another big challenge uh, we have. And a third, uh, just as examples, is uh, how to, you know, to to react to all these isms, uh, the fundamentalisms, the the populisms, and uh, especially one thing which concerns me is this whole um, conspirationism, you know, and a uh, scapegoat mechanism, which is not new in world history. Whenever there is a threat, whenever there is also lack of security, uh, where do you find orientation? You find a scapegoat, and this is uh, for the Americans, uh, for some Americans it was the Chinese, for others in the in the history it was the Jewish people. So we, we try to sort out these cows in our head and in our heart by simple answers, and that is an ethical challenge. How can we remain differentiated without falling in this, so to say, animal mechanism. No, the animals have not conspiracies, but uh, <laughs> we as as human beings. So how to overcome that? These are just a few examples, and uh, um, which I, I published, if you may, just in this book, Globalance, a global balance of, uh, of uh, we, we are like, uh, yeah, we, we need this balancing of values in order to, to, to overcome together. Um, the the situation and the, the, the together means multilateralism, but also we need to balance multilateralism with national solutions. Evidently, we have seen na state, nation states play a role, and that's also a message to those companies who uh, may have said in the ninth, uh, uh, around two thousand with the globalization, yeah, nation state is 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 forget about it. We don't need it anymore. I think we see that nation states still play a role, but only if they are connected through multilateral solutions. You know, you, you, you spoke about freedoms and you spoke about uh, rights and, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, as a journalist, I do have to say, I worry about what sort of world will be created post coronavirus, because uh, there is a sense that um, that the coronavirus pandemic has shown that if you want to put people inside their homes, uh, if you want to use the fear of a disease uh, in order to stop things like protests, it is possible to do. Uh, there is also, you know, the idea that surveillance and the privacy concerns of the past have now just been brushed under the carpet because, of course, tracking you, tracking the virus, contact tracing and all uh, takes precedence. How do how how would you say global institutions must tackle this idea that somehow personal freedoms have, in a sense, been put on hold this year, but must be restored at some point? Yeah, I think one one key is, is the that uh, we have to declare it as an uh, extraordinary situation, an emergency situation, and cannot be. Uh, as as a long term solution, and some uh, of course autocratic systems tried now to use this uh, the pandemic for uh, strengthening their autocratic mechanism. Whereas democracies, they say yes, we as a government we have to take decisions, but for a limited time, and after that it has to go back to the parliament. That's the debate also in Switzerland. The parliament says we are the democracy. Democracy, we have to take back some of the of the rights that have been on hold, so to say. Uh, so, um, but still, I think we also need to see that um, freedom, um, just as freedom of to do what we want, is not ethically speaking the only possibility to say uh, that is the the only uh, understanding of freedom. Freedom is always linked to responsibility. And uh, we cannot say, I, I want to, to go around and uh, infect other people. That's a misunderstanding of freedom. 
freedom without responsibility is not possible. And I think that's another balance that we have to to teach also our young people now. We have this challenge that uh, 20, 25 years old people, they say, I don't care about it. Until now, they see that now the, the biggest uh, population in Switzerland who is newly infected are the young people, no more the old one. So now they realize that we also need to take responsibility. So it's all about this balance, but it also, of course, has another dimension. That is, uh, what is now the the priority in my life, saving life versus, for example, if you are in poverty and you have any anyway nothing to lose, why should you protect yourself uh, because uh, you have nothing to lose? So it's also about inequality. The bigger the inequality, the more difficult to to underline this response or to to claim this responsibility, individual responsibility. Uh, very, um, uh, very well put, if if I may say so. Now, I want to come to some of the oh, and the word that you wanted to give us. I think I forgot Mr. Ranjan's as well, but um, the the word you wanted to give us for the global, if you want global coordination to be more effective, what is the word, the catchword of the moment, if you like? Global balance. Okay. <laughs> the same as your book. Um, Mr. Ranjan, I'm sorry I missed you on that. Did you have a word? Leadership. Um, very, uh, uh, very interesting so far. Uh, I wanted to come to some of the questions now, if I may. Um, and, and in particular, it seems as if we have been forced into catch to 22 situations. Um, and I'd like to start by asking both Vincent and Hedwige uh, these questions about the fact that um, what the coronavirus pandemic has done is put this immense pressure on the economy. And yet at the same time, uh, we know that the solutions cannot crush people. You cannot crush. Um, in fact, we've lost uh, Mr. Suragaldeen, but when I asked him what his word was, he said, uh, you must remember the one word he said was humanity, that these are people you're dealing with. So the, the catch-22 situations, for example, are obviously there is going to be um, the idea of fueling competence. Uh, is going to be necessary. You must make businesses much more competent. You must make assets deliver much more productivity. And yet you've got that challenge because you need to keep people employed. You cannot just uh, come out of this pandemic with more and more people unemployed because you could lead to a different kind of global pandemic if you like. Um, similarly, you want to move to the future of work. We're all now dealing with the virtual world, uh, speaking to each other rather than traveling to each other for a conference, uh, for example, um, uh, and, and talking about artificial intelligence and talking about robots. Yet again, you have to deal with killing the current workforce. Um, so, so my question to you would be, uh, is there a way to invest in ethical businesses more? Is that something the world should start? Henry, if we can start with you first. Yes, thank you. I think that's a very good question. And actually, as a banking industry, we have a, a very uh, long experience in this in this matter, as, of course, uh, uh, financial transactions uh, can be used for good or bad purposes. And the whole uh, debate also very recently in what, how can banks contribute to avoid or um, decrease financial crime, uh, to decrease or tackle uh, scams, is, is a very important one and a very, um, very appropriate also in this discussion. So what is the role of the industry? What is the role of public authorities? And what can citizens do in this respect? And I think that what COVID-19 has learned us is that uh, just um, uh, uh, think that globalization is is not a solution. I think it's it's much too short as an answer. We've seen that whenever there is contraction or uh, the GDP decreases, it's actually the 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 most vulnerable people who are hit first. So whatever you can think, we really need growth and a sound uh, economic recovery to be able to sustain also the poorest and, and tackle inequality. One of the basic questions left is, uh, as we are increasingly moving to a digital world, big tech world, 
uh, that leads to major questions. Big tech employs much less people, much less staff, and pays hardly no taxes, uh, taxes uh, so far. That's not a sustainable situation. So I think that's something that has to be tackled and is actually on the agenda of the OECD right now. All right. Uh, Vincent, do you have thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm going back straight to your question of uh, investing in, e in ethical businesses as a solution. I, I believe well, romantic capital's views that that's the only way. It sounds a bit romantic, doesn't it? That is correct, but uh, that is the only way in our mind. And uh, I believe it's, it's very challenging to invest uh, in ethical, uh, with ethical criteria, not challenging because it's not uh, right is just because it requires more work in structuring investments or transactions to align the social, environmental, and ethical values and profit with economic profit. And that is absolutely normal. That's going to be the new normal soon because all these variables are entering every single investor's uh, criteria to invest. So the people who, stru who structure transactions will have to come out with formulas to get this, the standard, right? But it is the only way, like investing in ethical projects, in ethical companies is the only way the, our economy will ever be sustainable because otherwise we're just throwing stones on our own roof. I, so I agree with a long-term view, that's the only way forward. But is, is it realistic? Because, you know, I mean, I, I see I think so. the point, which I is think so. that until there's an economic recovery, there's really not much to uh, to spread around in that sense. How, does, how do you tell a company? You know, in India, for example, companies were told you cannot lay off anyone for the next yeah. six months. I, you that, have that to comes keep back, paying. Sorry to, for interrupting you, but... That comes back to what I said at the beginning, is any investor, uh, rational investors, like what we're trying to do is attract rational investors to uh, ethical projects, right? So whether our companies or whatever it is, a, a rational investor looks for um, stability, clarity, and to be able to assess the risks of any investment. So as of right now, there is no stability, uh, there's no clarity in what's going to happen, right? So on a, like at this moment, what is required from investor is prudence. If you are running a business, you have to do and take whatever measures you, ha you have to take to make sure your business stays on, uh, afloat. Obviously, uh, applying always ethical, ethical conduct, right? But you have to do that. But as an investor, if you're just sitting on a pile of money, right now for you, the the in my opinion, the smartest way, way to act is to wait. Why would you put at risk capital quickly when governments don't have sorted out yet how things are going to look like in a bit? Mm -hmm. Since what I'm saying is the crisis is we have to first stop the coronavirus pandemic uh, healthcare crisis working together. And once that's done and clarity is there, uh, show or, you know, the authorities have to try to pave the way to show investors the potential of ethical investments with uh, that will attract their their money. So it's just right now it's troubling times. You can buy stocks when blood is in the streets. You can try that. But if you buy too soon, it, it might not be good for you. So as of right now, I think the thought is long-term view, patience, and obviously set in stone the ethical, social, and environmental values uh, for future investments. And that's that, those are my thoughts on that. I'm hoping I'm answering your question. No, absolutely you are. Um, uh, if I could come to you, uh, Jay Shanjan, and ask the other catch-22 that we are seeing, or you're seeing it in India, um, is that whole idea of uh, the access to uh, a digital, the digital economy, to the digital world, 
Um, and the idea that when it comes to education, for example, we've seen stories of uh, children who could not uh, afford a smartphone and therefore have missed out on their online learning for the last few months. Uh, how does a government really grapple with this idea that while you want to go digital on everything, uh, and you want the benefits of the transparency and, uh, and whatever that brings. Um, the, the truth is that the people, and, and I'm speaking about 40% of the world population, is not yet equipped to join that digital economy. How do you ensure that they don't just get left behind? So <clears throat> absolutely correct, uh, Suhasni. In fact, this is going to be the next big crisis which will confront a country like India. You are uh, driving uh, the digitalization process very, very hard. There are efforts to convince everyone to switch over to digital payments and of course, blended education and so on. But the digital infrastructure that is required to support and make it very inclusive, that is lacking. So there are uh, some very important national programs, but I would like to tell you something about what we are doing in the province because I look after the information technology subject here. So we have started a very, very ambitious program through which uh, we are going to provide uh, dedicated broadband connectivity to every home in the state. And uh, we have about uh, 8 million, 8.5 million households in, in, the, in the state. And every household will get a optic fiber bandwidth connectivity. And we are going to do this over the next uh, 8 to 10 months. And we are investing lots of resources for that. The reason why we are able to do it so quickly is that our state is already implementing a flagship project through which water pipes are being given to every household. As you know, in India, while uh, the rest of the world is used, most of the world is used to getting uh, pipe water by turning the tap. In India, at least in the villages, you have to go to a common stand post and fetch water and so on and so forth. So Telangana is endeavoring to become the first state where every home is having a direct pipe connection. And to do that, we have done almost 150,000 kilometers of trenching. And now we are in a very imaginative way using the same trenches to put our optic fiber cable also. So within a matter of nine months, every home, and I told you that we have eight hundred eight and a half million households here, each of them will get this connectivity. And then the opportunity to deliver education, health, e-commerce, other services, that goes on. So as a country also, we'll have to be very agile and be very fast in putting together this uh, digital infrastructure. And once it is there, you also have to, of course, uh, come in, also bring the buy-in of the people. See, we also are under no illusion that if tomorrow, if you connect every home, the very next day, people will start rushing and buying laptops and devices and tablets, etc. Mm -hmm. There will be hundreds and hundreds of people for whom this will not be a priority. So you must also show that digital solutions work for them. If you are able to identify the most pressing pain points in the lives of these people, and if you are able to solve them digitally and show to them that this digital intervention has improved your livelihood or your quality of living by so much, then you will get that uh, buy-in and confidence from the people. All right. Um, and Christoph, if I can leave the last word to you on how you ensure, because so much of what all our speakers have spoken about today involves uh, not just that idea of, uh, of humanity, but the idea of ethics, the idea of uh, doing global good, doing good for people other than yourself. Now, one hopes that the coronavirus pandemic has made people more aware of the need to help others. Uh, but in fact, what we're seeing is people are withdrawing into their own shells. They're creating little bubbles around them. Mm. Uh, if I have access to you know, what I need and I can work from home, then I'm not really thinking about the people out there who don't have jobs or uh, um, you know, have lost their uh, livelihoods. Um, and, and don't have access to the same things that I do. How does one change that at a global level? Let me say just one word uh, to, to the ICT issue, I think, and then I'm come back to a question. Uh, ICT, I think, is great fiber in every household, but I made exercises also with students in India and said, imagine you are for one day cut off all devices, because you had a crash of the satellite, a hacking or whatever, and uh, try to survive also without any uh, ICT connectivity. I think we need uh, also to decrease our fears, you know, 
we we need all that and i'm fully uh, uh, with that but uh, we should not become fully dependent on that now coming back to you just one word i think ethics we need to see behind ethics also spirituality in the broad sense i'm not speaking about one religion but we need this kind of spiritual roots and i think india is just one country which has this we need these spiritual roots which give us the strength to, to for this orientation so that we can say that we are it's not just a rational thing you know it's a thing deep in our hearts so that we remain in solidarity with others not just because it's a bit more uh, uh, less expensive and uh, so on it's a, it's a deeply rooted spiritual uh, co conviction and i think we need to come back to that also uh, that is not at all against those who say i have nothing to do with the religion but uh, we need to root our values really deep in our heart and not only in our mind all right um that's a nice note to end this in uh, i'd like to thank you all we had a few quick polls with all of you know four or five people voting but it seems as if the vote is still despite all the challenges we've spoken about the vote is still very much in favor of globalization against regionalization or breaking down uh, some of these challenges uh, in fact uh, there was a vote of favor for the who over other institutions um and a resounding no to whether the united nations has now outlived its usefulness and should be replaced as well um i I'd, i'd like to give you a round of applause but the way to do it i think is to take a, a one of these what they call virtual group fees so if everyone could just smile for the camera and i'll um, i'll make sure that it comes out nicely um there we go all right i i think everyone's got to take their their selfies so you have to click on i should also um uh, thank you for thinking of those words i'm going to take them with me and try to use them for an article i'm working on uh trust go global leadership and globe balancing uh if you like um it, this has been a, a really really interesting session uh thank you so much to all of you christoph jayesh hedvija and vaisen and i'm sorry that we've missed uh hearing from two of our speakers today but i'm sure they'll join us on another occasion thanks again thank you so much thank you all right thank you everyone Goodbye. and we